a very good evening to one and all so today we are heading towards lecture 5 on animal kingdom in last lecture we learn about phyla platyhelminthes and eschehelminthes which were flat worms and round worms in today's lecture we will learn about another phyla that belongs to animal kingdom which is the phylum annelids so basically uh, from this figure we can learn what we can learn about annelids is that that they belong to the kingdom animalia so they are multicellular they are heterotrophic that is their mode of nutrition is heterotrophic they are multicellular they are eukaryotes so this all these are the basic characters of organisms that belong to the phylum annelids now the animals that belongs to phylum annelids have organ system level of organization that is they have the uh, they have circulatory system so they have circulatory system they have excretory system they have nervous system so all these they have organ system level of organization these systems are developed in the organisms of uh, that belongs to phylum annelids they have bilateral symmetry that is their body can be divided into two equal halves by only one axis of symmetry and they are true coelom they have true coelom that is they are true uh, that is they are coelomates so they are triploblastic so we know what are triploblastic that is those which have ectoderm mesoderm as well as endoderm as their germinal layers so they have an ectoderm they have a mesoderm and they have an endoderm so this is endo let's say this is meso and this is ecto and they have a true coelom that is they have a true body cavity which is made up of mesoda so they have a true body cavity which we called as coelom right so the true body cavity is called as coelom and it is present in the organisms of the phylum annelids so they are true coelom uh, that is they are coelomates so basically what we know about the organisms that belongs to phylum annelid are they are animal that is they are multicellular they have organ system level of organization they are bilaterally symmetrical they have true coelom their body is with true coelom they are coelomates and such organisms uh, some of these organisms organisms with these characteristics belong to the phylum annelids now these are the basic characteristics what are the specific character about the organisms that belong to phylum annelids are we will learn now so why the name annelids why they are called as annelids so the term annelid that is the phylum annelida has been derived from the latin word annulus so this annulus means little ring and we will see that in phylum annelids we will have worms that will have the body structure of that has a ring like body structure the body is divided into different segments so they are segmented worms so these are the different segments this pattern of segmentation in the worms here is also known as metamerism so they basically have metameric segmentation this segmentation is very important property of annelids metameric segmentation is present in the annelids so this is important this is a kind of special feature metameric segmentation is present in annelids so this hence they are called as annelids because they have a little like this body as i mentioned is segmented and is a made up of little ring which is known as annulus and therefore the phylum annelids they vary in size from microscopic to tropical earthworms earthworms we all have seen so that also belong to the phylum annelid and it can vary over size from micro it may be microscopic so some organisms of phylum annelids are microscopic in nature while some of them may be meters long so they may be over 4 meters long as i mentioned the special property of annelids is that they have segmentation so annelids have segmentation segmentation what is segmentation it is the repetition of body parts along the length of the body 
So such segmentation is also known as metameric segmentation, as I mentioned, and it is present in the organ organisms of phylum annelids. So this is important that they have segmentation, and what is actually segmentation? It is the repetition of the body parts. Now they have a well-developed coelom. As I mentioned, they are coelomates. They have a true coelom. Which is filled, which is filled with the fluid, and therefore it acts as a supportive hydrostatic skeleton. This we will see in details that how this is helping in the movement, and basically how this hydrostatic skeleton is providing the helping in the movement of the organism in the annelid category. So a hydrostatic skeleton, along with the partitioning of the coelom. Permit independent movement of each body segment. So, as I mentioned, this hydrostatic skeleton is helping in the movement of the body segments of the organisms of phylum annelids. So, how this is helping, which we will see later. So, next they have a closed circulatory system. So, in closed circulatory system, we know that the blood is pumped with with the help of the heart. And it is carried through the blood vessels into the different organs. Suppose this is another organ of the body. It is carried with the help of the blood vessels. And like the open circulatory system, where the blood is being released into the body cavity and it bathes the organs. So this is the open circulatory system. This is the closed circulatory system where the blood. Reaches to the other organs through the blood vessels, so they have a closed circulatory system where the blood reaches the organ through the blood vessels, and their blood is red in color due to the presence of uh, pigments like hemoglobin. But unlike humans, where hum hemoglobin is uh, present along with the RBC, their hemoglobin is dissolved in the plasma. Now we know one of the special features of the In vertebrates, that they have a ventral solid nerve cord. So they have a ventral nerve cord. While if we look at vertebrates, like for example humans, they have a dorsal nerve cord. This we will learn later when we will learn about vertebrates. But uh, in in vertebrates, you will find the ventral nerve cord. So this is a differentiation between the invertebra uh, in the invertebrates and vertebrates, right? So in non chordates or in chordates, uh, like in in vertebrates and in uh, vertebr in in vertebrates and vertebrates, the difference is of the positioning of the nerve cord also. Now, uh, for their excretory system, they have paired nephridia. So paired nephridia is present as a part of their excretory organ. One of the special other feature is the presence of seta. So these setae are actually the bristles that produce that protrude out from the body wall. So suppose this is the body wall. So these are the setae that protrude out from the body wall, and therefore they help in the anchoring of the worm. That is, they help in the worm to get attached, and also they help in the movement. The so on the basis of The number of setae, they all organ organisms of phylum annelids can be divided into different categories. For example, oligochaetes and polychaetes. So, oligochaetes, as the name suggests, oligo means few, poly means many. So. Those annelids that have few setae are called, uh, belong to the category oligochaetes, while those that have many uh, setae present over the body, they belong to the category polychaetes. So they belong to the class polychaetes. A form which we which we are very familiar of, which we almost all of us must have seen that belong to the uh, class oligochaetes that have few bristles or few setae, and it uses the body wall for gas exchange. So oligochaetes, in oligochaetes, the exchange of the gases takes place through the surface of the body wall. While polychaetes, which are uh, which have many bristles, are mainly marine worms. 
so they are mostly terrestrial right they are present on the land so they are mostly terrestrial while these are marine worms that are present in the water so they have parapodia this is a special feature of polygates that they have parapodia they may be predators with a definite head region or they may be filter feeders with ciliated tentacles to filter food from the water next category is leeches so basically what we can say is that so this complete annelids can be divided into three types oligochaetes polychaetes and the leeches that is the hirudinid so this is the main uh, classes of the phylum annelids oligochaetes with few septa Cheeta, sorry, not septa. So there is a difference between the term cheeta and septa. Please do not get confused with these terms. They might seem uh, similar, but they are different. So cheeta are the bristles that are present on the surface. Septa are the segments. So few cheeta are present, then oligochaetes. If many bristles are present, then polychaetes. And the third category is leeches. so in general if we talk about in most of the uh, like mostly we will talk about oligochaetes like earthworms then we will have a brief discuss this discussion on polychaetes and leeches also so in general as whatever we have discussed we can see in this figure that they have both they have a complete digestive tract that is they have mouth as well as anus fully developed and they have pharynx esophagus crop gizzard as a complete digestive system so they have a complete alimentary canal so they have a complete digestive tract also as i mentioned they have circulatory system of open type so they have oh, sorry closed type so they have closed circulatory system in which heart is made up of five pairs of blood vessels so you can see here this is the heart so it is made up of five pairs of blood vessels 1 2 3 4 and 5 so five pairs of blood vessels together form the heart then it has seminal vesicle as a part of male reproductive organ these blood vessels are a part of circulatory system they have dorsal blood vessels we can see here and then they have ventral blood vessels so one that is lying on the dorsal side of the body is the dorsal blood vessel one lying on the ventral side of the body is the ventral blood vessel then they have lateral blood vessels also that supplies the blood to the uh, other organs nephridia is the uh, excretory organ and as a part of uh, as a part of like you can see that they have brain developed so civilization is present in them which was absent in the earlier organisms that we discussed so civilization that is the presence of the brain in the head is uh, appeared first in annelids so this is important that they have brain and uh, they have ventral nerve cord as a part of their nervous system so we will discuss about all these systems in detail uh, one by one so from this we can just have an idea about the organ system level of organization where now different organs are forming an organ system and together they are helping in the proper functioning of the body so how does the movement in annelids takes place so we learn that the septa helps in uh, like uh, they are they move with the help of the hydrostatic skeleton so how is it helping in the movement so in earthworms and many other annelids there are two types of muscles which are present so one is circular muscle and the another one is a longitudinal muscle so you can see in the figure like uh, suppose if i draw it here so these are the circular muscles that are being present so they are present like this if you imagine it in 3d right and these are the longitudinal muscles which are present along this axis so they have longitudinal muscles and they have circular muscles right these different uh, these structures you can see these are setae these structures which i am highlighting now as you can see these are setae and 
these divisions are called as chapters. So this is one chapter, this is another chapter, this is next chapter, like that. So uh, basically, these two muscles, like circular muscles and longitudinal muscles, they act together to change the shape of individual fluid filled segments, which are divided by the septa. So septa are the divisions, right? These septa, which is the division. So these, uh, this segment is filled with the fluid. As you can see in this also. So, they are fluid filled spaces. So, individual fluid filled segments help in the movement by changing the shape of the individual flu fluid filled segments with the help of the circular and longitudinal muscles that act together to change the shape of these segments. And then these shape changes bring about the movement which is known as the peristaltic movement. What is peristaltic movement? It is a movement produced by the rhythmic waves of muscle contraction passing from front to back. So just like when food passes through our uh, esophagus, we the, that passes with the help of the peristaltic movement. So in the similar way, the peristaltic movement that happens here is due to the muscle contraction from front to back helps in the movement. So this is a rhythmic contraction and relaxation. So rhythmic waves, production of rhythmic waves of muscle contraction helps in the movement of the organism in the forward direction due to the peristaltic movement. So the movement is brought, uh, uh, brought by the, produced by the rhythmic waves of muscle contraction from front to back and this is known as the peristaltic movement. So this is uh, how the crawling by peristalsis take place. So you can see that, as I mentioned, they have longitudinal muscles and the circular muscles. So this is the state when the longitudinal muscles are relaxed. So when they are relaxed, they are extended. When the muscles are, uh, and in that state, circular muscles are contracted. While in this figure, you will see that the circular muscles are relaxed and longitudinal muscles are contracted. So, suppose this is the head end, which is the anterior end, and this is the, these are the bristles, that is the CT. So, how this is happening is, at the moment depicted, the moment which is being depicted here, body segments at the earthworm head end. So, if we will focus on this end, which is the head end, we will see, and just in front of the rear end are short and thick. So, you will see that this region is uh, different and this region is different. So what is the difference taking place here is that longitudinal muscles are contracted and circular muscles are relaxed and are anchored to the ground by the bristles. So you can see that this is helping in the anchoring with the ground. So CT is helping in attachment of the organism with the ground. While if I talk about this other segment, this is thin. Right? We can see clearly this head end has become thick. This rear end has become thick. While the central body has become thin. So what is happening is, in this area, longitudinal muscles are contracted while the circular muscles are relaxed. The other segment which is thin and elongated, that is in this area, what is happening is circular muscles are contracted and longitudinal muscles are in relaxed position. So basically what happened is that initially at the head end, what happened is longitudinal muscles, so this situation happened actually. Let me use the eraser first. So basically when the movement takes place, what happening is at the head end, longitudinal muscles are contracting and circular muscles are undergoing the relaxation resulting in the thickening of the area. You can see in the figure also, right? This has led to the thickening or raising of the body part of that area. And these bristles come in contact with the land and helps in the attachment. So you can see that while in the middle portion, which is thin, what is happening is in that K area, Longitudinal muscles are relaxed while the circular muscles are contracted. And it is away from the it is away from the surface. You can see here, right? 
it is away from the surface in the next moment what happened is that the head now moved forward because circular muscles in the head segments have contracted now uh, opposite of what was happening in the step one will happen and circular muscles in the head segments contract resulting in the uh, upward uh, movement of the head and forward movement of the head so it will leave the ground you can see here the bristles have leave the ground have raised up above the ground and the forward movement has taken place segments behind the head at the now if this happens it might lead to the slipping so what happened is that simultaneously the segment which is behind the head now undergo circular muscle relaxation and longitudinal muscle contraction therefore resulting in the thick segment formation that anchor to the land thus preventing the worm from slipping backward again the um, uh, opposite of the uh, what was taking in this step two will happen again the head segment are thick and anchored in the new position the rear segments have released their hold on the ground and have been pulled forward so in that way this happens so once the head comes in contact to the ground then in the next moment what will happen is that the opposite will happen head has moved upwards the uh, next body part has come in contact with the ground so that is how it moves forward in the rhythmic wave like pattern which is known as the peristalsis so the contraction of the longitudinal muscle thickens and shortens the earthworm while the contraction of the circular muscles constricts and elongate it fine the next system is the circulatory system so this circulatory system has been shown for the earthworm and the earthworm which is an annelid has a closed circulatory system the dorsal and ventral blood vessels are joined by five pairs of anterior heart so you can see here if i zoom this image you can see that if this is the heart they have five pairs 1 2 3 4 and 5 and the dorsal blood vessel which is here is uh, then the dorsal and ventral blood vessels move into this heart which is five chamber uh, not five chamber but actually it is made up of five thick blood vessels resulting in the heart like structure that pumps the blood and they have lateral vessels that supplies the blood to the other organs so they the dorsal and ventral blood vessels are joined by five pairs of anterior heart that pumps the blood in the right you can see the lateral blood vessels so these are the lateral blood uh, like these are the lateral blood vessels that distribute the blood to the rest of the worm so there are three types of blood vessels present dorsal ventral and lateral so these blood vessels are present and they have heart which is five pairs of anterior that is five pairs of anterior heart Right. So this is the uh, components of the circulatory system in the uh, annelids, and they have closed circulatory system. Right. The next is the respiratory system. So the terrestrial annelids, like respiratory system, the lit there is little bit differences in the terrestrial annelids, like earthworms, and the other annelids that are present in the aquatic region. so the gaseous exchanges takes place through different means so in the earthworm you know that the terrestrial annelids like earthworms keep their body surface moist so in earthworms you will find is there what you will see is that their surface is really moist if you might have seen earthworms you might have seen that they are really moist due to the secretion of the component which is called as the mucus so this mucus helps in keeping them moist preventing them from their uh, preventing their body from getting dry and releasing fluids from the excretory pores so these things help in keeping the surface of the terrestrial annelids moist further the worm is behaviorally adapted to remain in the damp soil during the day when the air is driest so that is why it keeps its surface moist and in earthworm if you will see sorry 
so if in the earth form you if you will see in details what you will find is that their blood vessels are really in close contact with the outer surface the blood vessels are very close to the outer surface so this is the dorsal blood vessel which we discussed this is the ventral blood vessel which we discussed right so these blood vessels are very near to the outer surface and since they have a very thin outer surface outer membrane easily gas exchange can take place through these that is they can easily take up the oxygen and release the carbon dioxide so the surface so the gaseous exchange takes place through the body surface in addition to a tubular shape aquatic polychaete worms have extensions of the now what happens in aquatic polychaetes so as i mentioned that polychaetes have a very special structure which is the parapodia so this parapodia are uh, vascularized and they are used for the gaseous exchange so basically these polychaete worms have extensions of the body walls which are called as the parapodia and these parapodia are used for the gaseous exchange while the normal terrestrial annelids the exchange takes place through the normal body surface next is the digestive tract so as i mentioned uh, that they have the complete digestive tract meaning the tract is a mouth and an anus so this is the complete digestive tract of an earthworm which has been shown starting from the mouth to the anus they have pharynx they have esophagus they have crop they have gizzard and then they have intestine and finally the food passes out through the anus so earthworms mainly feed we know that it remains in the soil and therefore it actually uh, it remains in the soil and therefore it mainly feeds on the decayed organic matter which is present in the soil so it is also known as the farmer friend right because it helps in maintaining the uh, nutrient content of the soil by producing the humus so it feeds on the decayed organic matter which is present in the soil the muscular pharynx draws in food with the sucking action so food from the mouth passes to the pharynx so this muscular pharynx through the sucking action draws in the food food then enters the crop which is a storage area with thin expansive walls so this crop is the storage area where the food is stored until it is not required from there the food goes to the gizzard which is a thick muscular wall which is made up of thick so the crop region is made up of thin walls while the gizzard region has thick muscular walls and why thick muscular walls are required so these thick muscular walls helps in the grinding of the food so that is they help in crushing the food and send grind uh, helps in the grinding of the food digestion is extracellular within an intestine and the surface area of the digestive tract ha huh? so basically what you will see is that in their intestine they have a very specialized structure which is the diplosome so this diplosome is helping in increasing the surface area for the absorption of nutrient molecules so this is helping in increasing the surface area for absorption and it is a this is accomplished by an intestinal fold which is called as the diplosome so this is important that they have specialized structures which are diplosome in the intestine and in the intestinal folds and this diplosome is helping in increasing the surface area for the absorption of nutrient molecules so this diplosome is present in the intestine of the annelid so this is about the digestive system of the earthworm or the common annelids so they have a complete digestive tract that is they have mouth and anus and uh, they as i mentioned they feed on like they have the food passes from the mouth to the pharynx and through there from there it passes to the crop and when required it passes to the gizzard where it undergoes the uh, where it undergoes grinding and then the food is then absorbed in the intestine with the help of uh, like they do not have any stomach so the food is absorbed in the intest uh, 
then the grinded food is uh, digested extracellularly within the within an intestine only and from there the surface uh, the food is being absorbed the nutrients are absorbed and they have a special structure in this intestine which is the diplosol so this diplosol helps in increasing the surface area of of intestine for the absorption of nutrients so in the first lecture we learn about two terms that is the protostomes and the deuterostomes so analytes are belong to the category of protostomes right the next is the excretory organ we know that the excretory organ in the analytes is nephridia so this has here the metanephridia of an earthworm has been shown singular is metanephridium so each worm contains a pair of metanephridia each worm segment so th this is one segment right so this one segment consists of pair of nephridia within each segment a pair of nephridia is present that collects the coelomic fluid from the adjacent anterior segment so this will collect the coelomic fluid from this and this will collect this if this is the anterior side and this is the posterior side right so the region highlighted here in the yellow illustrates the organization of one metanephridium of a pair and the other one will be below this behind it so one has been shown here this is the serum which i was mentioning the body cavity and the fluid which is filled here is known as the coelomic fluid which is being collected by the uh, next segment and this is the network of capillaries which is shown here in the red color the they have collecting tubules then they have internal openings they have a bladder and they have external openings too. so you can see here they have external openings through which the waste is released and they have internal openings so how does this uh, work actually so metanephridia collect fluid directly from the coelom so it connect, collects the coelomic fluid now each worm segment has a pair of metanephridia which are immersed in the coelomic fluid and enveloped by the capillary network so we see here that uh, the fluid which is filled here is the coelomic fluid right so basically the metanephridias are present metanephridia are present in the coelomic fluid right so they are present in the coelomic fluid and they are immersed with uh, in the capillary network they are enveloped by a capillary network a ciliated funnel surrounds the internal opening so you can see here that this is the ciliated funnel that surrounds the internal opening so this is the internal opening where the anterior is open to the next segment and as the cilia beads fluid is drawn into a collecting tubule which includes a storage bladder that opens the outside so when the cilia beads the fluid gets collected into the bladder that opens outside to the external opening so as you, uh, this metanephridia have both excretory and osmoregulatory functions as urine moves along the tubule the transport epithelium bordering the lumen reabsorbs most solutes and return them to the blood in the capillaries so when the urine is moving along the tubule the, they have a epithelium lining is being bordered with the lumen sorry the epithelium lining the transport epithelium bordering the lumen so this epithelium lining reabsorbs the most of the solutes thus preventing the loss of solutes from the body and it returns them to the blood in the capillaries nitrogenous waste remains in the tubule and are excreted to the outside the nitrogenous waste can be ammonia if the organism is terrest uh, aquatic or it can be urea if the organism is present on the land so for example earthworm which uh, lives on the land the excretory material is urea while for the polychaetes which are mostly marine the excretory material is ammonia so we know that ammonia is toxic is more toxic and therefore it requires dilution so most of the aquatic animals may release ammonia but for the ones that are living on the land the ammonia may be toxic and therefore uh, their excretory material is less toxic compared to ammonia which is the urine so this 
point might help you in remembering that ammonia is the excretory material in most of the aquatic forms while urea in the animals that are present on the land next is the nervous system so annelids are complex animal with two nervous system and they have an invertebrate type of nervous system where the nerve cord is present ventrally so they have a ventral nerve cord so cephalization is present that is the present of presence of brain in the head is present there is a brain and a ventral nerve cord having a ganglion in each segment so you can see that they have a ventral nerve cord with ganglia ganglia are the actually turfs of the nerve so they have ventral nerve cord with ganglia in the each segment and these nerves are present all over the body the brain which normally receives sensory information controls the activity of ganglia and assorted nerves so that the muscle activity of the entire animal is coordinated so the brain act as a sensory organ it receives all the sensations that are in the surrounding and accordingly it instructs the ventral like accordingly it regulates the activity of the ganglia and the assorted nerves so that the entire muscle activity of the animal can be coordinated the presence of brain and other ganglia in the body of all these animals like in annelids indicate an increase in number of neurons among more complex invertebrates so as we are moving from poriferans to uh, annelids we are moving towards the more complex invertebrates so the brain the presence of brain and other ganglia in the body of these animals suggests that they have little more complex nervous system as compared to the previous invertebrates where mostly the nerve nets are present so in cnidarians and in cnidarians we have nerve nets that are present not much very well developed brain so therefore their nervous system uh, like we are seeing the progression of the nervous system also in the complex invertebrates the next is reproduction so reproduction if we talk about the earthworms earthworms are hermaphrodite so what we know about hermaphrodite is that both male and female system are present in the same individuals the male organs are the testes the seminal vesicle and the sperm ducts so male reproductive organ consists of testes seminal vesicle and sperm ducts while female organs consist of ovaries oviducts and seminal receptacles they have seminal vesicle they have seminal receptacles right during mating what happens is this has been shown in this figure this is earthworm number 1 this is earthworm number 2 so during mating these two earthworms comes in close contact with each other facing opposite so the anterior end of one faces the posterior end of the other while the anterior uh, posterior end of the same faces the anterior end of the other uh, earthworm so anterior ends are on the opposite side the fused mid body segment which is the clitelium so the clitelium is the portion from where the fusion happens where the fusion happen so the fused mid body segment which is the clitelium it secretes the mucus protecting the sperm from drying out as they pass between the worms so the worm will pa uh, so, uh, pass the sperm to the other worm so this clitelium secretes the mucus during this process preventing the drying of the sperm and when this worm separate the clitelium of each produces a slime tube which is moved along the anterior end by muscular contraction and therefore it help in passing the as it passes eggs and the sperms received a layer are deposited and fertilization occurs so the slime tube then forms a cocoon to protect the worms as they develop so this is happening how the reproduction is taking place in the earthworm so basically firstly the fusion happens the area the fused body segment which is called as the clitelium it secretes the mucus that prevents the sperm when it passes from one worm to the another worm and after the worm separate the clitelium of each worm it produces a slime tube that moves along over the anterior end so it will moves along the anterior end by muscular contractions as it passes 
eggs and sperm received a layer are deposited here and during this the fertilization happens when eggs come in contact with the sperm the slime tube then forms a cocoon which is the covering on the worm so the young worms are uh, the worms which are now formed are covered from in the cocoon there is no larval stage in the earthworm this is important that in oligochaetes larval stage is not there while you will see that in polychaetes the larval stage is present there so they are dioecious that is they have both male and female organ present in the same organism and they are hermaphrodites however the cross fertilization is taking place next is so this was mostly about the uh, whatever we discussed in details like reproductive system, uh, nervous system circulatory system is more or less similar in all the classes uh, however we will discuss a little about the polychaetes and leeches also that what are the basic characteristics of these classes so approximately two thirds of the annelids are marine polychaetes so of all the annelids two thirds of the annelids are the polychaetes in polychaetes the chitae are in bundles on peripodia so para means beside and podia podia word is always used for the foot so they have foot like structures so they which are pedal like appendages found on most segments so parapodia is a characteristic of polychaetes which is a foot like pedal like appendage which is found on most of the segments and uh, these are used not only in swimming but also as respiratory organs as i mentioned where the expanded surface area allows for the exchange of gases so this i, I have already explained that in polychaetes the surface uh, parapodia helps in the exchange of gases some polychaetes are free swimming but most live in crevices or burrow into the ocean bottom clam worms for example nereids are predators so most of the like polychaetes are predators as well so for example nereids they prey on crustaceans and other small animals which are captured by a pair of strong chitinous jaws that extend with the part of pharynx when the animal is feeding associated with its way of life nereids is cephalized that is just like other uh, annelids it has a brain having a head region with eyes and other sense organs so they have a cephalization present so most of the characteristics are same it just it is a difference in the environment in which they are living that is uh, leading to some of the different adaptations in polychaetes other marine polychaetes are sedentary that is they are sessile tube forms with radioles so what are radioles radioles are the ciliated mouth appendages which are used to gather the food for example christmas tree worms fan worms and feather duster worms all have radioles so in feather duster worms the beautiful radioles cause the animal to look like an old fashioned feather duster and hence the name polychaetes uh, have breeding season and only during these times do the worms have sex organs that are developed in nereids many worms simultaneously shed so how does uh, fertilization takes place so fertilization here is external and uh, how does it happen so many worms simultaneously simultaneously shed a portion of their bodies that contain either the egg or the sperm so this shedded portion may it either contain egg or may either contain sperm and these float to the surface where fertilization takes place when the eggs come in contact with the sperm then the zygote rapidly develops into the trochophore larva so they have a larval stage which is the trochophore larva while in the earthworms we see that they do not have any larval stage uh, 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 the polychaetes for example nereids have larval stage and their larva is known as the trochophore larva so these are the examples like uh, first is nereid succinia which is the clam worm so they are predaceous polychaetes so as i mentioned that they have eyes they have well developed eyes they have sensory projections their pharynx is extended thereby helping it uh, they have a jaw and their pharynx are extended that helps in catching the prey so basically this helps in catching the prey and they have parapodia as i mentioned that they have parapodia which is the appendages that are being present the next example here is the christmas tree worm 
so as i told that they have radioles so radioles are the ciliated appendages and that helps in the uh, feeding so they are sessile feeders they are uh, they are not movable they are fixed and uh, they are sedentary so they are sessile feeders whose radioles that is the ciliated mouth appendages are being shown that helps in catching the food and thereby catching the uh, thereby uh, helping in catching the prey the next class is the leeches so leeches are the annelids that normally live in the freshwater habitats they range in size from less than 2 cm to the medicinal leech which can be 20 cm long they exhibit various patterns and colors but most of them are brown or olive green the body of the leech is flattened dorsal ventrally they have the same body plan as other annelids but they have no seta so this is important that they do not have any seta and each body ring has several transverse grooves so they do not have seta so they are therefore different classes than the oligochaetes and polychaetes while some of them are free living most of the leeches are fluid feeders that attach themselves to open wounds and they are parasitic there so most of the leeches get attached to the wound and they sucks the fluid from the host so therefore since they have to suck the fluid they have modifications and among their modifications are two suckers a small oral sucker one around the mouth and a posterior one so they have an anterior sucker and they have a posterior sucker one which is present around the mouth and one on the posterior end some blood suckers for example the medicinal leech can cut through the tissue as we can see here it cuts through the tissue you can see this is the leech that cuts through the tissue and moves out so it can cut through the tissue leeches can keep the blood flowing using the hirudin so this is very important leeches are used for the extraction of hirudin hirudin is what it is a powerful anticoagulant so they have a very powerful anticoagulant in their saliva which is the hirudin since they have to suck the blood since they have to be uh, since they have to suck the fluid therefore they have to release the anticoagulant that prevents the clotting of the blood so this hirudin is used as an anticoagulant even in the medical sciences so this is really important that hirudin which is the obtained from the leech belongs to the phylum uh, so leeches belong to the phylum annelids so this is also one of the important importance of the uh, phylum organisms of phylum annelids so medical leeches as the name suggests it has been used in for centuries in blood letting and other procedures today they are also used in reconstructive surgery for severe dig digits like if there are any uh, digits that is the fingers or thumbs that are infected or in plastic surgery they are used for that where they are they help in keeping the blood in the flowing state by releasing the anticoagulant also so this was all about the phylum organisms of phylum annelids so we studied about phylum annelid that they have closed circulatory system they have well developed nervous system their excretory system consists of nephridia they have a uh, well developed like they have uh, well developed uh, digestive system also which is the complete digestive tract they are protostomes we have mouth developed first then the anus they are triploblastic animals they are two coelomates that is they have a body cavity then we see the classification into the basis on the basis of seta so if there are few seta which are present they are oligochaetes if there are many seta they are polychaetes and if there are no seta then they are they belong to leeches then they are leeches or the belongs to the uh, category of hirudin so these are examples also we see hirudo medicinalis which is a medical leech which is used in various medical applications from centuries then we studied neris which is uh, the worm which is a polychaete and uh, which is parasitic also then uh, in the oligochaetes we learn about the example of earthworm so this was all about the phylum annelid in the next class we will learn about the phylum arthropods so with this i would like to end today's session thank you for attending